So uh, I love where we are, by the way, if you're new around here. We've been in a journey through the book of Ephesians. If you are new, welcome. Uh, we know it, it's a big deal to come to church for the first time. And uh, you're sort of coming in midstream. We've been walking through this book called Ephesians, this letter to this young church, not too dissimilar from ours. And uh, if I had to distill the message down up to this point, it would simply be there are 10,000 things that are trying to define us, right? And so let's just say you've tasted a little bit of success right now, and maybe you're getting a little recognition for it. Maybe you have a, a booming business, or you've got a big house, or maybe you got stacks of cash, you know, stocked away somewhere, and people are like, wow, you are so successful, well, you need to be careful of that because you don't want that to define you. And the reason is all of that's variable, right? I mean, your business could burn to the ground and your ability to do whatever you do can be taken away from you. And so you, you just can't drop anchor in that kind of identity. And some of you on the backside of that, you're like, yeah, I don't live in that neighborhood because my parents and my teachers all called me underachievers. And I, you know, honestly, if I had to just really kind of put, put my stuff out there, I kind of feel like personally, emotionally, financially, I'm just scraping towards zero. And I guess that's just who I am. And you need to be careful as well not to let that define you. And the reason is there's only one person in the universe that is allowed to label you. Only one person in the world that's allowed to define you, and that is the one who created you. And so that's what makes what we're going to talk about today so powerful from the Apostle Paul. Ephesians chapter 4, we're jumping into verse 1. Here's what he says. He says, I, therefore, a prisoner... For the Lord. Okay, let me stop there because I think Paul knew who he was. And, and maybe to say it a different way, I think Paul had some self-awareness to know where he was. And he, he knew who, who put him where he was. He was in prison and he was comfortable with that. In fact, let me say it a different way. He, he didn't despise where he was. He didn't despise the season that he was in. Now, just for clarity, I'm not saying he loved prison. I'm not saying he's like, yeah, prison's awesome. Prison is totally underrated. It's a lot of alone time. I've been begging for this. It's basically like a vacation. No, he's not saying that. But what he did understand is that his season, where he was in that moment in his personal history in a prison cell, did not have to define him. But the one who put him in that season is the one that was able to define him. And so if you're going to get anything today, today in this moment, I just want you to hear this, that, that God knows you. God, God cares about you. God cares about every little step and fracture and particle of your life. And I know that because every season and every step and every moment in your personal history, he cares about that. And the reason I know that is because he made you. He wove you together and he's not someone that wastes anything for your good. And so there's a couple things we can hold on to today is number one is don't despise you. And secondly, don't despise where you are. Don't despise the season of life that you're in right now. In fact, listen to how Paul puts this in 1 Corinthians 7. He says, only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him or her and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. Was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Well, let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at that time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commands of God. Each one should remain in the condition or season in which he was called. So a couple thoughts here. Uh, first is this, is, is it appears that God is... God is, is far less concerned with accomplishing his purposes in your life around you. He's not that concerned with, with accomplishing his purposes around your life. Now, for clarity, does he want to use you? Does he want to use your vocation, use your calling, use where you are in this season? Like, yeah, absolutely. He, he loves to do that. But he's much more interested not in accomplishing his purposes around you. He first wants to accomplish his purposes in you. Do, do you understand the difference of that? And so let me say it in a way that's going to hurt some of your feelings. God does not need you. He doesn't need me. 
Like he's going to do whatever he wants to do. He's all powerful, all sovereign, all wise. He can accomplish and do his purposes on planet earth with or without us. I mean, it's, it's Isaiah 46, 10. From, he knows the end from the beginning, from ancient times, so what is to come. And he says, my purposes will stand. And so he's going to do whatever he wants to do. But here's what's so beautiful about that. He loves you and I so much. He's like, I long for my purposes to come alive in you. Okay, second thing, and this is what I think Paul is really getting at for us, is that the staying is where the growing is. The staying is where the growing. Now, this is not always true, and not, not every time, and not always true, but more often than not, it's true. I mean, when you and I drop anchor in the hard moments, in the hard times, in the difficult conversations, that's actually where God uses to grow you up in the Lord. And so if you're constantly looking for the easy way out, if you're looking for the smooth path, if you're pressing the ejection button when things get dicey for you, you will miss the opportunity to grow. You will miss the opportunity and and you'll never be prepared for the hard moments that are required in gospel obedience. Are you following? Let me say it this way. If you're here today and you're like, I'm I'm hungry for more of the voice of God in my life. And I hope that's all of us because he has not gone mute. I mean, he speaks through his word and because he's put his spirit inside of you, he longs to abide with you and speak to you. But if you're here and you're like, I want to I increase the, the, the voice of God in my life. One of the primary ways we do that is by obeying where we are. By doing what we know to do in this season of life. And so if you're constantly complaining about this season, if you feel justified to be cranky about where you are and you're dreaming about that next beautiful season, here's the bad news. You'll probably be in this current season for a while. And the reason is because your unwillingness to be fully present where you are, where God, by the way, puts you, your unwillingness to be fully present makes you unwilling to learn the lessons God has for you. And so you're like, I can't wait for that next season. And God's like, yeah, that'll be a while because I've got some things I want to teach you in this season so that you'll be prepared in the next season. I was thinking for an amen somewhere in there. Okay, (laughs) Ephesians chapter 4. Let's just start over. <laughs> We're in the series called Ephesians. I, I, need, I need a little bit of help here today. He says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. So this is where we're going. Our entire life, our entire identity is bound up in what God says about you. All that we are, all that we long to be is rooted and tethered to all that God says about you and God says inside of you. And and I can't underscore this enough. In fact, it's taken us 20 weeks in Ephesians just to get us to this place to remind us that the very reason Jesus left heaven and lived the life that we couldn't live and then died the death that we deserved and then was raised to to life by the power of the Holy Spirit. He did all of that, not to make you a better version of you. Jesus left heaven and came to the earth to make dead people alive people. And when dead people turn into alive people by the Spirit, guess what? He gives you a new identity. And there is a new spiritual formation in us that begins to inform the way that we live our lives. And so it makes sense. Then Paul says, yeah, live your life worthy of the gospel. What he means is this. He's not saying God's looking at you going, hey, uh, don't forget, dummies, like all that I've done. I sent my only son for you. So don't forget, you dirty, rotten, scoundrel, sinners, enemies of heaven. Get your act together. He's not saying that. He's like, look at all I've done for you. Don't forget, you're a son. You're a daughter. You're fully forgiven. You're alive. The grace of God's been poured out on you. Kingdom purposes are running through your veins. And so live your life worthy of that. Paul says this almost same thought in Philippians 1.27. I want you to listen to this. He says, whatever happens. Again, he's speaking about seasons. He's like, wherever you are. Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. So there is something that gets unlocked in us 
when we're able to see the vastness of all that Jesus is and all that Jesus is for us. And this is what Paul prayed earlier in Ephesians. If you're here in Ephesians 3, where he's like, I- I'm-, I'm praying that you would get a revelation of Jesus. A revelation isn't just seeing with our physical eyes, it's seeing with our hearts. It's seeing him for all that he is and savoring him with all that we are. And, and so when, when Jesus steps into your story, when he steps into my story and he redeems you and he restores your life, what he's saying is we begin to live our lives in such a way that reflects his immeasurable worth for us. We begin to live our lives as a reflection of his worth. Now, here's, here's the thing. I would imagine some of you, you're, you're probably going to ask the question, okay, John, I know Jesus, but my life does not seem to reflect the worth of Jesus. Meaning, if I really knew Jesus, then, then, then my life would reflect what it means to know Jesus. Like my decisions and my ambitions and my sexuality and my choices and my dreams and, and like everything that I am. Like it, it's not reflecting the beauty and the, the worth of Jesus. Like why is that? Because like, I know Jesus. And, and I would answer that question in two ways. Number one, I would say some of you, I would contend you don't know Jesus. Like, you know Jesus the way that you know George Clooney. Like, you, you know a lot of things about him. You might even know some really important things about Jesus, but you don't actually have a relationship with Jesus. And he is not the center. He's not the king. Everything does not orbit around him. And, and so those of you that are here and you're like, well, John, I do know Jesus. Like, I, I know I know Jesus. I've trusted him in faith for what he's done on the cross for me. My sins have been forgiven. I know I'm a son. I know I'm a daughter of God. And the reason I know that is because like the way I've been living, there's a deep conviction over my life. And I know like my decisions and my ambitions and my sexuality and my relationships and the way that I think and the way that I dream, like clearly it's not really tethered to the reality of the all surpassing worth of Jesus. Like why is that? And the way I would answer that question and there's a couple ways to answer it, but one way I would answer that for some of you is it's because you don't really understand who you are now. Like you don't really understand what happened to you, that heaven invaded your life. Let me put it this way. All humans on the planet, this is not just Christians, all humans on the planet, we live out of our, what we perceive to be the deepest center of our life. And, and out of that center, everything flows, right? Your decisions, your dreams, your ambitions, your relationships, everything, the way you spend your money, everything flows out, out of what you perceive to be the deepest center of your life. For the Christian, for the person that has placed their faith and their life in the person of Jesus, he's now the deepest center of your life. And yet if your life is not flowing out of that, no wonder you feel out of sync, No wonder you you feel disoriented. No wonder you you feel guilty all the time. No wonder you feel like, man, this is not how life is supposed to work. And the reason is you've got two competing realities in your life. You've got the deep center of Jesus that's crying out to deep. And you've got this life that's living for shallow pleasures. And so when you and I root ourselves in the deepest place of Jesus, everything changes. The way that we think, the way that we plan, the way that we talk, the way that we spend our time, our relationships flow out of that. And then, by the way, it doesn't happen overnight, right? I'm 48. I feel like a two-year-old, like spiritually. Like I, I like just, he is doing most of the abiding, and I'm doing most of the crying, okay? But here's, my point is simply this, is, is uh, many of you, you think the reason that Jesus came to the earth was just to set you free from your sin, Jesus did come to set you free from your sin, but that's not the only reason he came. He came to set you free from your sin, and he came to set you free for more in this life. And if you're not experiencing the more, it's simply because you're not tethered in to the deepest reality in your life, which is Jesus. Let's keep going. So when that happens, when you and I get tethered into who he is, he says, now we're going to walk with all humility and gentleness. Okay, um, I, I understand. Some people, I've heard people say this, that, that if, if the creator of the universe chooses you, that is not going to produce humility. 
Like if the most important person in the world chooses you, all that's actually going to create is a kind of pride, right? I mean, does that make sense to you? Like, let me put it this way. When I was in middle school, I did kickball. Anybody play kickball? For, if you're from Gordo, kick pin, okay? Um, <laughs> some of you are like, what's kickball? Um, <laughs> So I love kickball, but there is a, an element of shame to kickball, and, and the, the element is the way that you get on the team. So if, if this is, I think this is universal. The way it works is the most uh, athletic boys are automatically captains, and so you got JoJo and you got Jimmy. And, and, then, and then all the rest of us losers are in that like line of shame, right? And, and you know what I'm talking about. And uh, JoJo is like, I'll take... I'll take Matt, he can kick real good. And then Jimmy's gonna be like, I'll take Cindy, she can, she can spin the, the pitch. She can roll it with some spin, right? Like, and, and, and then, it, then it goes right, like they, they start paying, like I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick this person because they can do this, I'm gonna pick this person that can do this. And, and then inevitably, and I'm, and this is, I'm just a little, just sharing some of my heart here. Inevitably, it was always me and the other kid. We were last, right? It was me and the kid who pulled his socks all the way up to his underwear, right? And apparently, this was the first time he'd ever been outside without his inhaler, right? And, and the two captains now are arguing about who, who has to take them. And, and usually, it's like, you can have both of them. No, you can have both of them, right? <laughs> what is my point? I can't... Um, <laughs> My, my point is simply this, is when you and I get chosen for something, it produces self-worth in us, right? And, and what it is, it's the reminder that you're bringing something to a team. You're bringing something to a workplace. This is why when you get into a relationship or you get picked for a job or you get a promotion, what that does is it stirs up self-worth and you're like, wow, I, I have value. I'm bringing something to this relationship. But here's the thing, that is not how it works with God. When we get chosen by God, it actually does the opposite. We immediately are like, I know what I deserve. I'm not bringing any worth into this relationship on my own. Because actually what I deserve, I deserve hell. I deserve punishment. I deserve wrath. I deserve eternal exclusion. But God gives you grace. And when he gives you grace, that unmerited favor, which is grace, what grace means, that unmerited favor, you know what it does, doesn't do? It does not produce entitlement. It produces humility. Of like, I, I can't believe I get to be part of this. Now, let me tell you what I mean by humility, because we're living in a totally jacked up culture where words get reappropriated. Here's what I mean by gospel humility. I'm going to use that modifier, gospel Gospel humility does not mean weakness. It does not mean timidity. It does not mean you hang out in the shadows. Gospel humility means you, you just don't have to be right. You don't have to be first. You don't have to win the argument. God help us. You do not have to get on every thread on Facebook and win an argument. You don't have to. In fact, I would encourage you not to. Like gospel humility says, my strength is rooted in the strength of God. My security is rooted in the security of God. My center, who I am, my future, my present, all that I am is rooted in all that Jesus is. His all-surpassing worth is in me. And so I don't have to prove myself to anyone. And so I could be in the shadows because I don't need to be seen. But it also gives me strength to be a leader because I'm not leading out of my own strength. I'm leading a God's. Humility is maybe the greatest weapon the Christian community never uses. We have tethered ourselves to power structures and shame on us for doing that. We've tethered ourselves to some political party, shame on us for doing that. Every time the church tethers itself to power structures outside the kingdom of God, we lose our advantage uh, as subversives. And the most power, powerful subversive agent we have is humility. He says, and now with patience, bearing one another in love. Okay, I, I just, I feel like these two go together. Because I think we need patience from heaven to bear with one another. <laughs> yeah. 
like, don't look at the person. You're like, that's right. I need, a, it's, I need heaven's help for you. But I mean, like we, that's true, right? Um, Jesus says it a little differently, but it's same, same idea. John 13, he says, this is verse 34. He says, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. So this goes, goes to this idea of like, what well are you drinking from? Like if you're drinking from the well of self-worth, then you're going to be exhausted all the time. Like you're going to constantly be striving to get other people's approval, constantly trying to get other people's attention because that's the only, that's the only way you can get to bolster your self-worth. But when we drink from the well of God's worth, all of a sudden we find ourselves living and giving and serving and doing life in a way that feels very unnatural. It, it's called supernatural. And the reason is because we're now drinking from an eternal, never-ending well of love, right? Let, let me put it this way. How much do you think God loves you? This is not a trick question. Some of you are like, 72. I guess like there's not a number, right? Like he, he, he loves you more than anybody else on the planet times 100 trillion. Like that's how much, and I know that because Romans chapter 5 says, while you hated God, he loved you. Like anybody here like, yeah, it's totally easy to love people that hate me. Like, while you were still a sinner, while you were still in rebellion against God, he moved towards you. Now, with that idea of love in mind, listen to what Jesus says in verse 35. He says, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Okay, this is, this is where I, I had to do the, the deepest work this week for me, because this is overwhelming. And I don't mean overwhelming like, oh, isn't that beautiful? I mean, like, overwhelming, like, I don't know how we're going to do that, like, because... Because it's one thing to be like, yeah, we're going to love the global church. Like, that's cheap. It's like saying I can love my third cousin who lives in Idaho. Well, like, I really love. But it doesn't mean anything. Right? So, like, we can't really get our arms around loving the global church. So we'll put that to the side. We, we, we put a little bit of energy in loving the city church. We do that imperfectly. So we're going to push that to the side. And so let, let me just tell you where we're going to live as a house. We are gonna, we're going to love one another here. Like, I can't, I can't be responsible for loving the global church. You can't be responsible for us loving the city church with extravagance. But I'll tell you what we are responsible for and we've been gr given grace for is to love each other here. And when Jesus says that, he's like, I, I want you to love in such a way where the world notices. He's like, this is how they're going to know you're their disciples. I mean, notice that he's like, this is it. It's not because of, like, a political party. I mean, the world does not get the church. They think we're a voting block. And Jesus is like, no, no, no. The way the world's going to know is by the way that you, in, in clarity. He's not saying the way that you love the world. He's like, the way they're going to know the church is real, the way that they're going to know that Jesus is resurrected is by the way that you love each other in here. That's how. And so he's like, when somebody comes into the building, they're going to be like, I, I've never seen a love like this. I've never seen a kind of love that is so extravagant when somebody busts up their car and the people around them are like, I'm gonna, we're going to give you some money. We're going to make sure that car gets fixed. Because <laughs> the, the cost. Like love is only measured by cost. What's it going to cost you? When a single mom comes into the house and she's like, I'm, I, I'm, I'm working, I'm going to school, I've got this little baby, and, and I'm doing everything I know to do, but it's still not enough. And then families come around that woman and go, I'm in it. I'm, I'm in it. And I'm telling you, people will come out and be like, I, I've never seen a love. Like, we, the world equates love with affirming. Like, I'm just going to affirm who you are. That's, that's called hatred. Because Jesus comes and he's like, listen, you're not enough. You're not enough, but I am enough. And so the deepest love for us is when we come along and we pour out extravagance on one another, no matter where a person is. We say, oh, we're in this. This love's gonna cost me. It's gonna cost me time. It's gonna cost me my convenience. It's gonna cost me my agenda, but I'm in this because this is what love does. I, 
I looked up the word love just because I was curious. In, in the Greek, that word love is the, is the same word it is, it is in John 3.16. Some of you that have church experience, John 3.16, that word, just like here in the Greek, is the word agape. And there's a lot, if you've been in church for a while, there's lots of words for, for love. But agape is sort of the supreme word. And one of the definitions that I found that, ironically, I love. I love it so much. But it's, here's the definition of agape is to give preference to give preference. I mean, how upside down is that kind of love? To go, I'm, I'm going to give you preference. And, and most of you, you're like, I, I don't want to do that. I don't like that kind of love because I love my preference. I default to my preference. And the reason I love my preference, because they're my preferences. Your preferences are terrible. <laughs> so like, why would I want to default to your preferences? Because I have my preferences. It's just so much easier, right? But What Paul's saying is when the immeasurable worth of Jesus invades us, when his love invades us, all of a sudden it becomes second nature to give preference to others in the church. That's what he's saying. And here's how good God is. And and I know, because again, I know some of you are like, I don't like, I don't like the idea of giving preference because who's going to take care of me? Right? But here's how good God is. When you and I are like, you know what, I'm going to step into gospel love and I'm going to default to other people's preferences, here's how good God is. He's like, well, good news, I'm building a church of people that are filled with the Spirit, overwhelmed by grace, and they're going to give you preference. And you're going to bear their burden and they're going to bear your burden. And all of a sudden you realize this is a marriage in which no one loses. And that kind of love will confound the world. Let me finish because I'm out of time. He says, verse 3, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Okay, what I want to do is I want to just, I want to highlight the word eager here. Um, And I'm not dismissing unity in the bond of peace. We're going to get to that next week, okay? Um, What Paul's saying is when you and I experience the, the immeasurable worth, grace, power, mercy of God over our life, what it does inevitably is it creates a a, a gospel eagerness in you and I to do good. Like we become eager to do gospel. Like we can't help it. It's like a tick. It's like OCD for the gospel. Like I just can't help but do good everywhere I go. I just can't help it. I just like, just can't help myself. Like doing good wherever, because it's in you. God's put it in you. And and that's going to make sense for those of you that are are in the gospel community. But if you're new to the redemption story, what you find is that there may be no better adjective for God than the word eager. Because what eager means is it means driven, self-determined, single-minded in pursuit. And so you got to ask, okay, what is God pursuing? What he's pursuing is he wants to put himself on display everywhere. That's what he's eager to do because he knows he's the most satisfying, loving, grace-filled person in the universe. So he's eager to put himself on display everywhere. And so you can see that fingerprint of eagerness everywhere. I mean, from the very beginning, God takes nothing and he makes everything, right? And then the hundred billion trillion stars, they're all displaying the glory and the knowledge of God, Psalm 19. Right? And then he puts the law on our hearts. And then he does miracles in the desert. And then he delivers his people out of Israel or out of Egypt. And then Jesus shows up and he's like, well, yeah, just in case you're not seeing that God is eager to get your attention, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to turn some water into wine. And then I'm going to walk on some water. And then I'm going to feed 5,000. And just in case you think I'm resting on my laurels, I'm going to go ahead and die for you. But I'm not going to stay in the grave because I have an eagerness in me for you to see and savor how good God is for you. And so I'm going to rise from the dead. And then I'm going to, the spirit that caused me to rise from the dead, I'm going to put that spirit inside of you. I'm going to give you a new heart. I'm going to give you a new identity. And this supernatural, persistent eagerness that I have to do good to you, he's like, I'm going to put that kind of gospel good inside of you. And everywhere you go, you can't help but do good. The picture that I had this morning as I was praying was, was a God mustering an army. 
But it's not an army of guns. We're armed with love. We're armed with the most supernatural weapon that the kingdom can offer. Love. We love those in the shadows. We love those on the stage. We love those that are marginalized. We love those who can't help but put themselves in the center of the spotlight. Love is what moves the heart of people. And oh, that God would make us a people of love. Why don't we stand together? Father, I, um, I know how much we need, but I pray that, that we would actually be more aware of how willing you are to give. We're just saying today that our posture in this moment is not a posture of spiritual poverty, but we're a posture of recipients of never-ending grace for us. What you give us is more than enough to transform our hearts, to transform our families, to send a tidal wave of grace over our city. I want to invite our, our prayer team to come forward. And if you're new to Hope City, one of the things that's really important to us is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And what that means is we really believe that God wants to meet with you today. He wants to, to do something supernatural in you today. Some of you, he's like, I, I want to heal your body today. I want to heal your marriage today. I want to give you supernatural direction that you've been longing for today. And so we're just, we're just here and we're saying, okay, Holy Spirit, you're more wise, more powerful, more able than any one of us. And so would you come and would you, would you do what only you can do? And so we want to invite you into that.